Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Douglas Laboratories educational webinar. Today's topic is the importance of hormones for healthy aging and active lifestyles, presented by Dr. Joseph J. Collins. My name is Christy Belalovic, and I am the Director of Product Development and Clinical Education for Douglas Laboratories, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. A reminder that this presentation will be recorded for viewing at a later date, and questions can be submitted anytime through the GoTo toolbar located on your screen. So you may have noticed recently that Douglas Laboratories has focused their attention on helping guide you, the healthcare practitioner, to find the right nutritional supplements for your patients so that they can live healthy, active lifestyles as they age. We realize there are many factors that play a role in how one achieves and maintains healthy aging, but our focus today will be on hormones and the role they play in the aging process and quality of life. Now, who better to deliver this important information to us is no other than Dr. Joseph J. Collins. Dr. Collins is an internationally recognized leader in the field of functional endocrinology. He is an experienced medical educator and presents many lectures to physicians, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, and other healthcare professionals on di diagnostic and therapeutic applications with an integrative functional medicine model. Dr. Collins is licensed by the state of Washington as a primary healthcare naturopathic physician. He is a graduate of National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon. He is also the co-founder of Your Hormones Incorporated. With attention to highly personalized care, Dr. Collins' clinical protocols are available for healthcare professionals who use natural and integrative therapies. His customized therapies include a focus on functional medicine as a primary approach for support of menopause, andropause, CMS, adrenal health, as well as thyroid and blood sugar function. Dr. Collins is a clinical advisor, researcher, and developer of nine hormone-specific formulations available through Douglas Labs. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Christy. It's good to be here again and to share some of this new information we have on um, hormones and healthy aging. I, I think this is a really exciting time in um, the history now. The science keeps rolling out and validating things that we've been saying for years about the fact that we can actually make a difference in the aging process by helping to um, optimize hormone function, uh, promote helping the body handle oxidative stress and some of the other things that are involved in the aging process. We're going to talk about some of those ages of uh, some of those theories of aging in a moment. Uh, first of all, as we go through the slides, you know, here's the disclaimer that you just heard discussed about in my biography is this next slide here. As an overview, we all realize our hormones diminish as a consequence of normal aging. And one of the debates is, you know, are they aging because we're old or are we old because they're aging? And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. I think in reality, it is, there's not a linear answer to that. Uh, it's all going to be connected. We're going to talk about how we can maintain uh, not just healthy but balanced hormones. I think many of you recall back in the 90s when I started to look at the, when I introduced the concept of let's actually calculate the progesterone to estradiol ratio and start to look at numerically how these numbers are. And now we're seeing people looking at T to E ratios, D, you know, testosterone, estradiol, DHA to cortisol. I think relational um, fun analysis is very important as well. Uh, well. We also realize that the hormones are responsible to maintain a wide range of functions, including not just sexual health, but body weight and blood sugar levels. Blood sugar is not just a function of insulin we know now. We know that every one of the hormones, what we call the sex hormones and the adrenal hormones, as well as the thyroid hormones, are somehow involved in glucose metabolism. So it's not just about insulin, it's about all the hormones working in harmony. And as Chrissy mentioned, we're going to talk about all the different hormone imbalances, but with the focus being on um, healthy aging and active lifestyle with a personalized approach. Um, and those are going to be some of the most important things to look at. I do um, recommend use BHRT when it's appropriate. But those of you on my website, you'll see there's a page where I say BHRT should be used as like the last resort, because if we can repair the body's function, then we're doing a great favor to the patient. And if we get the body function at its utmost, then when it gets to the point where we do need BHRT, what we're finding is we're getting much better clinical outcomes with lower dosages. So when I have patients on BHRT, they respond very well to low dose BHRT as contrast to what we found, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, when we didn't realize that we had to really take care of the foundational and the cellular response first. 
many of you have already heard a number of webinars that I've done in the past. Douglas Laboratories has uh, invested a lot of resources into making sure they maintain a very large database of a number of different uh, speakers on their website. The ones that I have on my website are the ones focused on the, the hormones I've given. Uh, these are the ones that are real detailed. The one I gave on men's health, thyroid health, adrenal, women's health, and estrogen dominance. So those ones go into tremendous detail about the science, the biochemistry, into each of the ways that we can address these uh, hormone conditions. So this time, today, we're not going to go real deep into the detailed science and biochemistry and the chemical constituent inside each herb as much as we're going to talk about the actual applications. I mean, like what I like to call the so what. So what are we going to do about this? We're going to we're going to give a quick review of the endocrine systems because you all know about it. But we're just going to make sure we, you know, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to mention new science when it's appropriate, when it's something that's going to make a difference in how we practice today. Uh, I really like to focus on practical applications, what we can do today or tomorrow, you know, if you don't have what you need on hand to make things happen. And dietary and lifestyle changes are now part of the conversation. It's like I say to my patients many times, it's not just the pills and the potions and the powders, it's, it's your lifestyle choices that make a big difference. I think you're all aware of the uh, whole concept of the blue zone, uh, areas that uh, they found that with this uh, lo great longevity because of lifestyle changes. And keep that in your mind as we go through this aging process. It, it, it's the lifestyle change that make a very profound difference. So if you have not been to the new website Douglas has now, I really encourage you to look at it. I'm really excited about how they've clustered all the major functions into it, the 10 of them here. Um, it, when our patients come to us, it's not just about hormones. They're worried about their, you know, their skin appearance and the health of their skin. So there's a section for the skin under the beauty, the bone and joint to maintain proper bone and joint function in the aging patient. Cognition and mood, very, very important as we age and people start to develop more digestive problems, that section. The foundation is actually a really important um, component and I believe that that's one of the first things that we address on all patients before we even address those high level ones. Uh, the next column over there you see the cardiometabolic or the heart and metabolic uh, disorders that we can do to help our patients with that function. Next of course is my favorite uh, section on hormone which include not only my formulations, but a number of great formulations that Douglas has designed over the years. Uh, clean Athlete also kind of come my second favorite about all of the um, uh, unique formulations that we can use to, make, to help us maintain our, beta, our greatest athletic performance uh, using those certified products. Vision, I'm finding that more important these days. <laughs> And then, of course, um, to personalize you, you're going to have to customize the different vitamins, minerals, amino acids based on your patient's needs. So we're going to focus on hormones, but as I'm very commonly heard saying, it's not just hormones. There's a whole thing that we have to look at. So what are the theories of aging? What, what are we hearing right now? We, we're hearing a lot about telomere shortening in which we're, you know, we're programmed to die because the telomere shortens as time goes on. Then you read one paper that say telomeres don't matter. Then they find living organisms without telomeres and the ones that we can manipulate back and forth. It's still a theory, but they do see a correlation, but, but a correlation does not necessarily causality. The causality may be some of these other things on this list. You know, we look at the fact of oxidative stress, the wear and tear, you know, the rate of living. All these are different words that people use to discuss how oxidative stress takes its toll in the body and how that can actually lead to programmed cell death apoptosis, which then again brings us back to telomere, the whole cycle goes over again. Glycemic stress is a uh, one of the theories of aging as well. We don't only like, like costlate our hemoglobin. You know, we talk about hemoglobin A1C. We're now realizing that we're glycosylating our um, adre um, adrenal, uh, excuse me, pituitary hormones like glycosylated LH is interfering with um, the ability of the end organs to make hormones and are responding to glycosylated LH. We're glycosylating a thyroid globulin and creating antibodies against our own hormones. So high blood sugar is not just, oh, it's just hemoglobin A1C. We're actually glycosylating much more than that, and that's accelerating the aging process as well. Inflammation, you know, trauma, um, autoimmune diseases, um, the wear and tear again, you know, cytokines, all these things we hear about can, can cause the aging process. DNA damage, a lot of overlap you see in here. 
mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, these are uh, the mitochondria is not working adequately in things that we can use like ribose and ubiquinol and other things to increase mitochondrial function. And then of course the ubiquitous stress. Um, when we're not in homeostasis, as you recall from previous conversations, homeostasis means similar state of you know we're in the, pretty much the same state of existence. When we're not in that, we're in allostasis. So even though we have popularized the term adrenal fatigue, it's, it's not just adrenal fatigue. Allostasis means every system in the body is no longer in its, its optimal state of function. And of course, the endocrine theory, endocrine senescence being one, nutrient deprivation slash dysfunction. We don't think much about malnutrition uh, in this day and age, especially with so many, you know, with the abundance of food we have in this society and all the multivitamins and minerals, but we're realizing now that the different polymorphisms in our genetics that make it so a nutrient may not work, the most common one being folic acid. So someone can take all the quote folic acid they want, but if they're not taking the activated folic acid, the methyl tetrahydrofolate, they can have a nutrient dysfunction. Another interesting point is about, it's, I think it's about 30% of, um, of us do not adequately convert beta carotene to vitamin A, so we actually can have a vitamin A relative deficiency which is why um, when I created a nutrient, I make sure we don't just have beta carotene, but we also have uh, vitamin A. So nutrient dysfunction can take place even if you're taking multiple vitamins, unless you're taking the ones that have the activated ones, which is basically all, all the different nutrients that Douglas Laboratory has, they use the activated forms. So the aging theories is probably best looked at as a cluster, not a list. They're all dynamically interconnected, and we can say this is the cause I think we're going to step back and say they're all causing it. They're all causing the aging process and affecting the endocrine system. And here's the classic endocrine system. I think you've all seen this. I grabbed it off of Wikipedia because it's probably the most popular. Well, here's all your glands in one quick picture here. Um, we're going to talk about each of these, some of them briefly, some of them in more detail. Uh, the pineal gland, pituitary gland, thyroid, the thymus, adrenal gland, pancreas, and of course the ovaries and the testes. One of the most important things to, um, that I try to teach patients is a lot of them heard about what they call the HP axis, okay? Well, the HP axis, A-X-I-S, means the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, A-X-I-S, but the hypothalamic pituitary, pituitary axes, plural, include the hypothalamic pituitary's conversation with not only the adrenal but the thyroid and the gonadal tissue as well, so we're looking at plurality of, of axes going on here. And then we talk about, um, you know, endocrine, um, you know, different stages of endocrine dysfunction or people having problems with endocrine. You can have a primary endocrine disorder or primary endocrine problem, meaning that it's actually endocrine gland itself or the hormone that's, that we can blame. That would be a case in which the thyroid itself has been destroyed by the autoimmune disease. That's a primary endocrine uh, problem. A secondary one is because of the HP axis, because the pituitary gland is no longer giving the signal to the gland, so the gland is sitting there doing nothing because it's not being told to make hormones. And a tertiary one is one that we're starting to pay more attention to now, where the target tissue receptors um, in, at the other end are, are not listening. You, you basically have end organ lack of responsiveness, or reduced end organ responsiveness to thyroid hormones is a big example. Like if you were to look up um, thyroid hormone resistance inside quotes, you're going to find literally hundreds of papers. We're now recognizing that a lot of the hypothyroidism that we're seeing out there is not because of low thyroid hormone levels, it's because of end organ resistance. And this is something that you've heard me talk about years ago when I developed Thyramend because half of what that formulation does is to actually talk to end organ tissues and get the tissues to respond to the thyroid by receptor RNA and DNA function. Okay, so these are some of the big concepts that apply to all hormones. Another important concept is this whole thing of circadian rhythm, and I know we talk about this, and it's like, yeah, we know about circadian rhythm, we've been talking about it for years, and you know, let's kind of move on, but, but this is what's really interesting. Recent research has shown that one night of partial sleep deprivation, okay, you only slept four hours last night, we can test you now and we can actually see genetic changes that show you've aged more. And I'm not just saying by one day. It looks like, wow, you look much older today than you did yesterday according to some of the gene expression from your blood. 
So sleep deprivation, we find out it's been much more detrimental than we once thought it was. We realize that just one day that can deteriorate the 25 rhythm will affect neurological function, immune function, mood behavior, and uh, all these things, and, and then the sleep problem is just made worse and worse. So circadian so rhythm is something that has always been a part of what I talk to my patients about. In fact, when, um, when we look at circadian rhythm here, it, we often think of melatonin. Now melatonin, as you know, is made by the pineal gland, which is this little orange one right here, if you can see the pointer, and it's in the back here, okay? And, and that seems to be involved with circadian rhythm regulation. Melatonin is a very powerful free radical scavenger. It's a very strong antioxidant. It's one of the, you know, we make one of the best antioxidants out there, right there in our own little heads there, right? It's an immune regulator to balance the immune system. It can control the health of the cells to prevent um, abnormal cell growth and division and, and abnormal um, angiogenesis, et cetera. It's very neuroprotective, cardioprotective. Um, if we're not making enough melatonin, then we should be taking it as a um, powerful antioxidant and very protective. But keep in mind that the, the pineal gland is actually told what to do by this little red dot right here that you see in the front, and that's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's a nerve cluster. It's not like it's an endocrine tissue, but it's a nerve cluster that communicates with the pineal gland to produce, to produce melatonin. And that's something that's going to be uh, very important for us to understand the consequences of that. So if you talk about the neuroendocrine component here, we realize that the suprachiasmatic, not the charismatic, the chiasmatic nucleus uh, communicates with the pineal gland and it sets up a circadian rhythm that is also going to affect the pituitary gland. Why is this important? Because the pituitary gland is responsible for putting out the trophic hormones. When something doesn't grow, we say it's atrophied, okay? So it doesn't grow. Well, trophic means to grow. So the pituitary gland puts out the adrenal, adrenal corticotrophic hormones, the gonadotrophic, the thyrotrophic, etc., and that's why it's important. So when people have sleep deprivation and they wonder why is the uh, endocrine system aging more rapidly because they're, they're not getting the deep REM sleep that's required for those trophic hormones to be released between 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, we're going to have uh, accelerated senescence of the endocrine system. And that's the interesting point. When people say to you, always wake up around 3 or 4, well, that's because you're, you're basically, you know, your body's wired and fried and all this stuff, and when you do pop out those hormones, you're waking up out of it because you're not in deep enough sleep. So you're being woken up because your adrenal glands are fired between 3 and 4. We need to do what we can to get you into deeper circadian rhythm, a deeper sleep. And so, I mean, as far back as I can remember, I've been talking to people about what I like to call circadian reprogramming, okay? Sounds ominous, but it's actually quite simple, right? Circadian reprogramming is how we can program the 24-hour rhythm. Now, Grant, I've been doing this for decades, and, and it really makes a difference. I say, in the morning, look out the window. The grass is green and glistening. There's a blue sky. Green and blue light knock out melatonin, okay? So it's going to lower your melatonin which is important because then your cortisol is going to come up when your melatonin drops. You need that little pop of cortisol so those little aches and pains and stuff go away and you're ready to start the day. You have that zim you need, okay? Um, the morning is also the best time to exercise because the body is at the highest cortisol levels. It can handle the demands of exercise. Exercise, as much as I enjoy getting on the bicycle down here in Florida, it's still physiologically a stressor. Vitamins are best in the morning, especially the B vitamins, B12, will metabolize, or should I say catabolize, it'll break down melatonin. You know, so I tell people, you can take your multivitamins in the morning, take them at noon. See, this is the practical stuff we're talking about now. Take your vitamins morning at noon. If you take them too late, like at 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, you're going to start to mess up your melatonin function, and you're not going to get the deep REM sleep, and then you're on a downward spiral. And I go so clear as to say, you can take them at morning and take them at noon. If it's, you know, 12.01, it's too late. Of course, they can take it you know, as late as one, but I'm trying to get the point across. You can't keep pushing off the vitamins. You're going to fry your melatonin. You're not going to get the REM sleep. And then, of course, you can use um, um, circadian adaptogens, all right? These are the adaptogens that most of us think as, you know, stronger adaptogens, more young ones, uh, more um, the kind you'll see in, like, testogain, uh, the kind you'll see in adrenamine. Adrenamine has a mixture of different... Um, 
forms of adaptogens, but adrenal men and testosterone gain are best taken in the morning. Those are going to be morning circadian rhythms, and also endocrine complete is designed to be taken in the morning because it, it supports all the trophic hormones and, and the pituitary function at that time as well, and of course it has all the vitamins, so you don't want to be um, taking those in the evening. Um, we're going to talk more about endocrine complete in a moment. In the evening, you're sitting around the campfire, there's a red and yellow, or back in the old days when we had incandescent light bulbs, before we had these blue and green fluorescent ones, the incandescent bulbs put out red and yellow light, or basically low watt light is you want around your house at night in the evening. Have a calming activity. This is a time for fellowship and community activity and socialization, like they talk about in the blue zone, uh, being connected. Minerals, now's a good time to take calcium, magnesium. Melatonin, awesome, good time to take that. And the calming nervines. Uh, some of the plants that can help you sleep better, like for instance, ester men, one of the reasons it's effective is, as well as it having all the constituents that we need to help control vasomotor symptoms, most of the herbs inside ester men are also have secondary calming, soothing, relaxing properties. So when we take ester men at night, they don't get those rises of the um, luteinizing hormones and FS, all those pituitary hormones that cause the vasomotor instability, and they sleep great on it, okay? So for years I've been saying this, I've been basically been telling people it, the synchronization of the biological clock neurons by light, either green or blue or red and yellow, and by peripheral feedback systems, the exercise, the ethics you talk about, promotes circadian rhythms and health, which is actually the name of the article there. There's actually, that's actually the name of the article. I was really excited that came out this month. They've actually proven what we've known for years, that you can change your circadian rhythm by light and by your environment. And don't underestimate the power of that. I've gotten rid of many, quote, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia patients just by getting them back to sleep on a normal circadian rhythm. So we all know the pituitary gland. Uh, on, the, on this side here is the anterior. And here's the posterior side of the pituitary gland. We've all seen this in many different pictures. We know where it's located, right here in, the, in, in this part of the brain here. But let's talk about what the pituitary gland does. Again, these axes, more than one axis, are involved in creating trophic hormones. You have the gonadotrophic hormones, FSH and LH. The follicle-stimulating hormones basically produce follicles. They're going to create either uh, spermatozoan or eggs. The luteinizing hormones are going to create the hormones. So the LH is responsible for not just ovulation, but also for promoting um, testosterone and estrogen in, in, in both uh, genders, as well as helping with estrogen in women. So FSH is the um, gamete and LH is the hormones. Uh, lots of hormones, okay? <laughs> SH is thyroid stimulating hormone. There's many herbs that can mimic SA, uh, uh, TSH to stimulate thyroid hormone. There's many herbs that can mimic and actually stimulate gonadotropic hormones. We're going to use those. Um, melanocyte, that has to do with uh, skin pigmentation, obviously. We don't focus too much on that. Um, especially I'm in Florida, I need to worry about that now. <laughs> uh, Adrenocorticotrophic hormone is going to stimulate the adrenal gland to make the next day's batch of hormones. You're not going to get that circadian rhythm, the nice rise of cortisol in the morning, drop at night if you don't have ACTH. And that, 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 that rise of cortisol is directly linked to the melatonin rise. If you lose the melatonin rhythm, you're going to lose the cortisol rhythm. So people who complain about not getting that nice robust cortisol spike in the morning, uh, go back to the literature, you're going to find that when they, the, the pathway is the melatonin is also not working properly. It's the deep melatonin sleep that stimulates these axes to fire properly. So here's the axes that we, that we just mentioned again, and they put out trophic hormones. Sometimes it's spelled tropic, but it's actually trophic as yes, it means to grow. Um, and we have the HPA, the HPG, and the HPT. So one of the first objectives that we're looking at if we're trying to prevent the um, progression of the aging process is to prevent these tissues from atrophying. So we're going to choose herbs that can do that. Endocrine Complete, was I put this together as a multivitamin to provide all the nutrients we needed, but I also want to use herbs that had documented ability to be adrenotrophic, gonadotrophic, and thyrotrophic. You can see the chart here, and you'll be able to see more information um, down on my website and in Douglas's website as this is all um, being put online for you. But these, how these herbs work is they literally tell your body to make more hormones. Okay, this is repairing of hormones. Hormone replacement is wonderful. It's a great technology. 
I recommend it. I, 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 uh, many times I've prescribed it. I, people I care and love about are on BHRT. But if we can do hormone repairment therapy, that's even better. So we're going to look at how we can repair hormone function. In fact, that's one of the foundations of what Adrenamend did, w w was designed to do from the beginning. When I first created Adrenamend, I focused on all many of the homeostasis regulatory systems. I'm showing 12 of them here. There's actually more of them uh, in, that regulate us, as you know. There's multiple systems that regulate homeostasis. But the three that I have highlighted are the HPA, HPG, and HPT. Is the advisability to tell itself to make hormones function properly? That's what adrenaline does. So it's not just the adrenal glands. It actually promotes the production of all the hormones. And of course, this one, all the herbs have been documented to raise um, HPA function in that one. But let's look at some of the other ways that we can enhance hormone function. Okay, each of these formulation I designed have those big charts to talk about all the actions of what progesterone does. Like for instance, progesterone has galvanergic properties. Uh, progesterone has um, progesterone as as a hormone uh, helps balance the immune system, and some of the herbs inside here mimic that. So if you look at the full chart, you'll see the I have posts on my sites. The chart's quite big, but I just wanted to show you the progesterogenic herbs inside here. Peonia, Romania, Buplam, Coleus, and Vitex have all been documented to support normal physiological processes that are required to make your own progesterone. It's great to be able to prescribe progesterone, but it's important to make your own. Why is this important? Because 60% of non-luteal progesterone comes from the adrenal glands. Okay, so in a woman's in her monthly cycle, the follicular phase, over half of her progesterone comes from her adrenal glands. In men, all of our serum progesterone comes from our adrenal glands. So, you know, of course, adrenaline will help with that too, but herbs that can raise progesterone are important because, you know, I'd rather re repair than replace, whether it be my hormones, my car engine, or my heart. I'd like to see if we can repair it first before we start replacing things, okay? <laughs> uh, testosterone um, production, we have trophic support for that as well. Each of these herbs have been documented to increase either LH and or FSH and collectively the ones you see highlighted are able to do that. And uh, this is why you, you read these papers about, you know, wow, they raise hormone levels. Well, how do they do that? Well, they do it because they're trophic. They tell a pituitary gland to tell the end organ to do the job it's supposed to do. And the same with thyroid. This is this was uh, real interesting as well is, you know, we're starting to have, a, there's a lot of debate about what TSH does and doesn't do and how accurate it is as a, as a, as a marker for thyroid function. I will tell you right now that some of the papers I've been reviewing recently, they found out that 30% uh, of people with diabetes have and hypothyroidism. So you have a patient who's diabetic, they have low T3 and or low T4, well, 30% of them have normal TSH. Okay, so, um, or even, you know, or, or, or even on the low end, they're not, TSH is not telling them what's going on. So what I found here is herbs that actually mimic the actions of TSH. Specifically, what does TSH do? It promotes iodine uptake by the sodium iodide supported proteins. It promotes the iodine being bound to the protein of thyroglobulin. It promotes thyroglobin production and promotes secretion. So this is thyrotrophic activity. It's like a mimetic. These will mimic what TSH does and tell your thyroid to get back to work. You know, we need some more hormones here. Now, you've always heard this saying, to every rule there's an exception. Well, here's an exception here. Estermen was specifically designed not to raise estradiol. Okay, those of you who have read the website and the, my little private notes I call professional guides on my website, you'll see that what these herbs do is they're all mimetics. They, um, they can mimic estrogen. They can get rid of vasomotor symptoms. They, they help the heart and all the different things you see outlined there. And this actually has to be updated. But every single one of them as of recently, in fact, this year we now have evidence that every single one of them actually promotes cellular health um, that is, is not going to cause the problems that estrogen causes. If we raise estradiol levels, you remember estradiol is a proliferative hormone. We don't want to increase proliferation in someone with a history of, uh, of uh, proliferative disorders. And we don't want to do it in people that have family history risk and people that are just anxious on it. And especially if someone's on um, you know, BHRT and I want the BHRT to work better. 
you know, I use this. So all these herbs here are, are not are designed to not be um, proliferative, and so um, we're getting all the symptoms being taken care of, but without raising estradiol in these patients. Now there are herbs I can use to raise estradiol, peonia and trigonella, but I don't use those in estrogen. Those you're going to see used in um, testicles for women because most women that have low testosterone uh, have problems with estradiol, and we'll make a note on that in a minute as well. Um, so again, we've been talking about making hormones and all the different systems that do it, but again, we need to keep in mind that it's not just the hormones that we're talking about here. We're talking about um, hormone function, antioxidant support, etc., and um, those are some of the things we want to talk about next. So again, we talked a little bit diet, sleep, and rest. We talked about circadian, exercise, and recreation, social interactions, hydration, elimination. Just to bring back the point, this is what's important for our patients to not just get them straight on hormones, but to talk to them about lifestyle changes. Every one of my patients, I talk about the foundations of hormone health on the, when the very first visits. And this is a paper that you can download. It's a full text article. The name of the paper is Celiac Disease Associated Autoimmune Endocrinopathies. Uh, by Kumartal, and this is a great paper they put together talking about how celiac or gluten intolerance can affect every endocrine tissue. So yes, I want them on the multivitamins, essential fatty acids, and probiotics, but also want them to understand that there are consequences to dietary changes if you are predisposed towards being sensitive to those changes. We all understand the sterogenic pathway. We've seen countless diagrams and pictures and ways of showing it. Some of them are correct, some of them are incorrect. Um, this one, I just want to point out that the systemic pool of estrogen is actually estrone and estradi estradiol. Um, some people mistakenly put estriol up inside there. Estriol is a metabolite of estrogen, just as is 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone, which as we know is one of the bad metabolites. 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone, not good, right? By the way, the, name for the, the scientific name for estriol is 16-alpha-hydroxyestradiol. So keep that in mind is that when, you know, estriol, the, the common name for it or the you know, pet name for it, it's actually 16-alpha-hydroxy metabolite. That's important to know because just as if we take estradiol in a body that's full of oxidative stress, okay, it's going to get oxidized into estrone. So anyone who's taken 16-alpha-hydroxyestradiol need to maintain proper antioxidant protection so that it does not become um, oxidized and become estrone as well. Or reduced, excuse me, come that, yeah. Okay, the two hydroxies, and then of course you have testosterone metabolites as well. So power I'm trying to teach patients is understand the difference between primary hormones and metabolites. And many of you have seen some of the new tests, and these, these metabolites go on forever and ever. But even more important than that is, is when you make hormones, what's in between each of those steps. So I show them this little chart here and say, let's reduce the hormones down to those little red dots. Okay, now those little red dots represent a specific hormone, like here's testosterone, okay? Well, how did I get from this hormone or this hormone over to testosterone? It has to go through these series of enzymes, and I tell them that enzymes is just the big word we use um, to describe the, you know, the, the proteins that are involved with changing the structure of one hormone to another one. And they require cofactors, and cofactors is our biochemical way of saying vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. So every step along this way, we cannot transform one hormone to the next one or to its metabolite unless we have the vitamins and minerals and cofactors that we need. And this is why a lot of time and effort and research and a lot of prayer has gone into putting together endocrine complete. We want to see what vitamins and minerals do we have evidence on, how do they directly affect hormone production and function. So I, I, I always mention to people, look at the vitamins, look at the minerals, and I always mention diet as well. I don't want people to think I'm just trying to get them to you know, live off of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the capsule. They need to get whole foods that are going to be very rich in, in phytonutrients and antioxidants as well. And again, I recommend two in the morning, two at noon. Well, so what are some of the specifics that are involved with this? Well, specifically, you know, boron, we know, is involved with both uh, estradiol and testosterone production, but in men it's interesting because if we have the right amount of boron, it, it will normalize our testosterone to estradiol ratio. Okay, so men with boron deficiency, our TDE ratio flips upside down, we become, you know, true estrogen dominance. The estrogen becomes more predominant than testosterone. So boron is important in that function. 
calcium is involved in pretty much every metal, you know, many, many processes in the body, but um, in the adrenal gland, um, the very beginning hormone, pregnenolone, is very dependent upon it, as is aldosterone, and the ovary progesterone requires calcium as well. We usually don't have a problem with that, so, you know, I just thought I'd just mention that as a side note. Glucose is not the only um, thing that's affected by chromium. DHA uh, enzyme are uh, chromium dependent. Copper is uh, the enzymes involved in both adrenal and both gonads. Ovary and testes are copper dependent. The th iodine is not so about the thyroid anymore. We now recognize research showing that all of the HP axes, the HP, G, T, and A, are all dependent upon having proper amounts of iodine. So it's not just to make the thyroid hormone, it actually helps the HPA axes, all the axes. That should be E inside this. See, I made the same mistake as everyone else. All three axes uh, I needed to, uh, no, that's the adrenal axis requires that, never mind. It's the adrenal axis requires iodine. Um, magnesium, the steroid pathway is all dependent upon that, as is insulin. Manganese, all the tissues you see there. The thyroid actually requires molybdenum. Now that was something that I found was interesting because you know most people don't think of molybdenum as an essential trace mineral, but it's it's required as a cofactor for some of the enzymes involved in uh, thyroid hormone production. So we want to put just a very few micrograms of that inside there as well. Selenium is not just for the thyroid; it's for all the hormones. And zinc again is required for all the tissues as well. Um, not not uh, so. There's an idea for some of the minerals that are required. In that thing here. Uh, and again, going back to iodine, I apologize. It's the hypoglycotorate adrenal axis, specifically the adrenal gland requires iodine. That is correct. I didn't mean to say axes there. Okay. Selenium is important. Again, we, we talk about a lot for thyroid, and here's, we've discussed this in the past, and you can review that in the thyroid webinar. Um, you know, human studies have shown that 20 micrograms of selenium in the form of selenomethionine can help. Um, us deal with the problems of having the anti-TPO antibodies in the, in the body. Keep in mind proper levels though because the RDA for um, selenium is based upon human studies, okay? If you, if you go back and study some of the original research from the National Academy of Presses and, and how they determine the RDA and the upper limit and the you know um, lowest observed adverse effect limit and stuff like that, um, there are some upper limits to this and, and um, on the website I talk when you start to get above a gram you were starting to get into trouble, but the um, National Academy of Presses thinks that 400 is a good dosage of it. Up, um, above uh, 1.2 grams, you start to leak thyroid peroxidase and um, enzymes into the system and increase risk of having anti-TPO. So as they say, all things in moderation. Uh, selenium is one of them, as is a number of those other minerals we talk about. Essential fatty acids is something that we've talked about in the past. There's some great webinars on it and Douglas's server. Uh, I wrote a new to news on it years ago. Uh, the most important thing here is that the essential fatty acids can help with hormone signaling and they can also help you know, so that the cells listen back to the hormones and they can also help modulate cytokine activity, you know, how much inflammation is going on. Remember, inflamed enzymes, inflamed tissues aren't going to work better, uh, aren't going to work as well as if they're not inflamed, that's to be controlled. Here's another interesting paper. These little dots you see down here, when you go online, you can look at these numbers. That's going to be a link directly to the, the PubMed article. You can download and read the whole article yourself there. Uh, some, a lot, I tried to use the free papers as much as possible. Some of them I had to buy. Um, this was a nice one because it actually shows that if you have a certain glucose level, um, here's how much cytokine activity you get. But if you add, if you double the, if you add a lot more glucose from 1 to 4.5, the cytokine TNF alpha goes quite a bit higher. But if you give that same environment high amounts of glucose plus omega-3, you don't get that TNF alpha response. So we have evidence that, yes, omega-3 fish oils um, do help modulate the um, cytokine response. Remember that picture how glucose, glycemic and inflammation, oxidative stress are all connected? This is one example of that. Uh, oops, wrong one. Do it back. Go back there. Okay. We, if you download the newsletter, um, new newsletter a while back, you're going to see that graphic that it shows how it's made, and you're going to see all the references on doses guidelines that I like to use. What I tell people is a real good baseline is 20 milligrams per kilogram, and if someone has problems with their immune system, the and you can see the references there, 40 milligrams per kilogram 
it's pretty impressive to um, stabilize uh, inflam you know, immune response by using fish oils. So again, we're not just talking about hormones, we're talking about how to keep the hormones healthy by um, other things, in this case, the essential fatty acids. And um, there's a number of papers. I always like to grab a few to show up here, and, if you, and you see a number of references. The reality is, is probiotics, we know they do a lot more than we thought they did, and now we're seeing evidence coming out that probiotics can benefit thyroid function by actually helping with cell signaling. Is the thyroid listening to the cells? Gene expression, cytokine activity is affecting it. Um, they support healthy immune system, and they're going to balance off the um, um, cytokine ratio. So again, uh, part of hormone health is is not just the BHRT. It's the nutrients. It's the herbs that affect um, tissue listening and trophic action, and it's the oils and the essential fatty acids. So what we're talking about here is is the all the different systems working together. This is commonly referred to as the uh, neuroendocrine immune system. You know, the neuroendocrine immune system is, is basically the interaction between the nervous system and the endocrine system as a response to stress. And what we're seeing is that systemic inflammation will adversely affect every system of the body, including each of the endocrine systems. You know, and, and even and on the other hand, even the hormones will adversely affect the immune system because estrogens are more. Um, enhancers of immune response, more like pro-inflammatory compared to the androgens such as DHA and testosterone which, and progesterone, which are more um, immune modulating or calm or suppressing the immune system. So there's a big connection between how the uh, immune system and hormones work. So I, tell, I don't just want to focus on hormones. I try to tell my patients it's, it's your immune system and your um, neurological system are in, intimately involved with how good your hormones are going to function here. Many of you have seen the work I've done in the past talking about uh, controlling systemic inflammation um, with uh, systemic enzyme support therapies. There's a number of posters, a lot of re research done in this. You can find it on my website. It's on uh, yourhormones.com uh, slash inflammation is where you find it. Just click inside the search engine. You'll find all this quite a bit of information that we've done quite a bit of it if you already, but review it if you're not familiar with how the um, inflammation system can affect every system, including the endocrine system. So if you look at the foundation of, of okay, what we're going to do is a pure foundation of how to get, you know, basic hormone function going. Number one, all the nutrients. The endocrine complete has all the activated vitamins that we want. It has the activated folic acid, um, you know, paradoxal 5-phosphate for the B6. I have not just thiamine inside there, but also benfotamine, the lipid soluble kind. We have, of course, the methylcobalamin and on and on. We have all the activated nutrients. We have the proper minerals are required in the proper ratios according to what we see, how they interact with the hormones. Um, the foundation of fish oils is important, as we discussed, the probiotics and controlling inflammation. This is important even before we look at hormone-specific formulations, and, and especially before hormone replacement therapy. You know, I'm, I'm very well known to have said if you take a patient who has base, you know, nutrient dysfunctions, essential fatty acid deficiencies, dysbiosis, and inflammation, and you put them on biodegradable hormone replacement therapy, all you have is someone that is nutrient deficient, essential fatty acid deficient, dysbiotic, and with systemic inflammation on BHRT. You know, so I found this out decades ago that VHIT does not work unless we take care of foundations first. So that's the first thing we do, and all of a sudden, you know, the VHIT works wonderfully. I know the patients are rushing to us and asking for VHIT. It's all over the news and all over social media, but they've got to do their homework first, and they have to build a healthy foundation. And, and Douglas Labs has everything you need to do that, and, um, and I feel an obligation to make sure my patients do that. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to get the results they want. Then they think, that I'm making a mistake with the BHRT or they think the pharmacist is not mixing it right and the problem is, is the tissues aren't listening. And the same thing goes when they choose the hormone specific formulations. You need a healthy foundation. Okay, these formulations were each designed specifically for, you know, the hormones as I mentioned. Now, many of them were raised, designed to use trophic hormones to raise levels such as the test again over here. The progesterone is progesterone trophic, thyroid trophic down here. Estramen is an estrogen mimetic. It addresses all the symptoms. Read on that and see what we're getting done with that. Adrenamen basically is not adrenal. It's all the homeostasis regulatory systems. And then we have some things to control when there's too much estrogen. 
you know, true estrogen dominance is, is really high estrogen. That estrogen dominance became popularized in the 90s when everyone was pushing progesterone. But the reality is, is you know, some people didn't have high estrogen. They just needed progesterone. So it was actually a progesterone deficiency, not estrogen dominance is what they, what they were calling it back in the 90s. It was actually progesterone deficiency. Let's call it what it is. But today we're actually seeing true estrogen dominance in which people have too much estrogen compared to the testosterone or the progesterone. Yesterday I reviewed a paper that was actually written in 1975, okay? Think about that for a minute. 1975, and it pointed out that older gentlemen have higher estrogen levels than women of the same age. And we're going, well, how can that be happening? Well, because as men age, our livers and the little adipose tissue that we have so collected over the years is really good at aromatizing our, what testosterone we have. So in men, estrogens are getting higher as we age. In women, their ovaries have gone to atrophy and the estrogens are getting lower. So estrogen dominance has been around for a long time. And, and part of the estrogen dominance is, is the gentlemen that are, you know, you're giving a, a testosterone shot. And if they don't have aromatase inhibition on board, if they can't control that, then they just turn that to estrogen. And then they keep coming back and they want more and more estrogen. I say, no, you need to get an estrogen quench. So your, your testosterone stays testosterone. We understand um, and anywhere from 8 to 12 to 15 percent, depending upon who you read. Some people say 30 percent. I don't think it's that high. But a lot of women have androgen excess disorders. And for men who need their testosterone controlled to protect their prostate while we have time to you know, fix that, um, we have test for that as well. Okay, let's look at a few more things here. Um, the thyroid gland, we understand we look at all the hormones. TSH stands for too slow to help. If you just test TSH, 30% of people with diabetes is going to come back normal, but they are already hypothyroid, as I just mentioned. So TSH by itself is a, a test that doesn't, what's it, yeah, worthless, that's the word. TSH is by itself is a worthless test. I think we all know that. We need to start measuring at least 3T and 3-4. Uh, look at reverse T3 if you think that they're having problems with that, and we have to measure the antibodies because now we're seeing the antibodies are actually causing some cross reactivity, and we actually have an anti-thyroid hormone, anti-thyroid globin antibodies. It's um, we live in interesting times. Okay, <laughs> here's some of the specific actions of thiamine we talked about. It's going to give you iodine, iodine uptake, make the hormones conversion, increase receptor, bind to DNA and cellular response. What's interesting is the last three components here of what these herbs are designed to do have nothing to do with making hormones. Okay, they have to do with tissue response. So again, thyroid hormone resistance. Look at those three words inside quotes, and you're going to see hundreds of papers that are now coming out recognizing that in the periphery, the cells are not listening. Okay, I saw this happening years ago, and now we're seeing why this, this is working because we're really improving thyrocyte receptor function. We're actually helping to bind to the DNA and to the cellular response. All those references are there. And yes, those herbs actually do help the thyroid bind to DNA and bind to messenger RNA. It's pretty amazing what you can see here. That's a quick review for those of you who have seen the thyroid webinar. And again, here's what we talked about. The different steps are give the body iodine, get inside the cell. All the iodine in the world isn't going to help unless you get inside the cell. Make the thyroid hormone. Then convert T4 to T3, and hopefully make less of this nasty reverse T3. We're going to make some, but we don't want it to be predominant, okay? And then the last three parts, the most important, is get the thyroid hormone inside the cell because the thyroid receptor is very complex. It's two different proteins that come together, a TR and an RXR. So it's like a French door with one wood door, one metal door. Whereas all the other hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, have what they call homodimers, the exact same proteins come together in the pair. These are heterodimers. No wonder why we have so much thyroid resistance. The, the, the receptor is very complex. We have coactivators that thyroid, that many herbs mimic coactivators. They talk to the DNA, and then, then result in messenger RNA to have the cell do what it's supposed to do. Remember, hormones don't do anything. They're messengers. That's the most important thing I need to remind people is, I don't, your hormone levels really don't matter if your cells aren't healthy because all they do is they, they're supposed to talk to the cell. If your cell's not listening, if your cell's not responding, then me giving you more hormones isn't going to change it. So all the first things we talked about, foundation of health, and yes, that includes detoxification and, and control of oxygen. That's what matters. 
because hormones by themselves, all they are is messengers. Unless the cells can react to them, we're getting nowhere. So here's some of that, like what I like to call the so what. So, so what do you do for thyroid health, okay? Well, very basically, if a patient comes in and I see low thyroid function, then, you know, even clinically, okay, you know, the, okay, yes, their thyroid's in the 29th percentile. Well, even peer review literature is now saying, quote, um, subclinical hypothyroidism is 30% or less in the normal range and the patient feels lousy. So if someone's in the, quote, normal range, but they're 30% and below, even if they're a little above 30% and they're miserable, you know, I'll still put them on thiamine and, 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 and endocrine plus. The reality is, is this isn't going to jack up your hormones. It's going to help your body make its own thyroid hormones, but the body has its own check and balance systems. You're not going to induce hyperthyroidism by restoring normal function. I'm not replacing hormones. I'm repairing them here. So thiamine and endocrine plus are going to be the very basic foundational things that people need to get their thyroid started. If the patient says, and by the way, I mean, I really want today you to do something about this tremendous fatigue I'm feeling because, like, it's not just, it's not adrenal fatigue, it's everything's fatigued. My whole body's tired and achy. You know, they, they can say they have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, whatever the saying of the month is, you know. I do adrenamen for that. What they actually are, they have allostasis is what it's called. There's another term for it as well you're going to hear about in a few minutes that Hans Salier called it. And uh, also what I found is when people are on a weight loss program, they're taking under 1,000 calories, some of them quite a bit lower than that, but I'm going to say hello, and, they, and it was not working, and they're taking it, and then I put them on both thyramen and adrenamen together. Now, adrenamen helps the body adapt to change. So all of a sudden, they're taking the thyramen and the adrenamen, and the same diet they're on, the same caloric restriction, they're losing weight like gangbusters, okay? because their body is no longer maladapting. It's saying, okay, i got to get out there and do the work, and it's no longer shutting down. Starvation causes all the system to shut down to survive. Adrenamine and thiamine together puts metabolism back up, and um, they're losing a tremendous amount of weight and have to have some of them add more calories. If they need immune support, if I'm seeing only anti-TPO, then I use selenomethionine. I tell people anti-TPO is the thyroid is PO'd, okay, it's kind of irritated, the thyroid site's leaking. So anti-TPO is thyroid is unhappy and the thyroid sites are leaking, they're not damaged yet. But if I see anti-TG, that means that the thyroid guts are spilling out and the blood's seeing it and it's making anti-thyroid globulin antibodies, so that's anti-TG. Selenomethionine is for anti-TPO, Wobenzyme N, um, and I've, I've shared this literature with you all many times, is the only paper found that will actually lower both anti-TPO and anti-TG antibodies, okay? And then, of course, the other foundation we talked about, the Probox, the quail fish oil. I haven't, we're seeing probiotics and fish oils do help with abnormal immune diseases, okay, abnormal immune functions, but I haven't yet one found specific for thyroid, but uh, many of you know that many papers talk about many conditions where, where the, um, the immune system has become self-destructive, can be modulated with those two things. Now, what about the other end of the tissue that everyone has forgotten, the thymus? No, that is not a picture of a tongue. It's actually supposed to be a thymus, okay? <laughs> um, old mythology was that the thymus turns into a lump of fat at a certain age and does nothing, okay? We now realize, based upon both human and animal studies, that the thymus remains active and it is involved in the production of cells that wind up creating the cytokines, okay? This is like a whole multiple series of talks in and of itself. But the reality is that when the body's exposed to inflammation, and you see some of the things that stimulate thymus uh, cytokine production down here, you know, like viruses and super antigens, okay? That could be, you know, maybe gluten, you know? You, 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 you know what I'm talking about, right? All these can be involved in stimulating cytokine activity. So the thymus is actually an endocrine gland and thyroid and um, immune gland together. Think of it that way. It, it's involved in, in putting out cell signals or chemical messengers, but instead of calling them hormones, we call them cytokines. Cytokines, I tell some people, are like the hormones of the immune system. We know how to fix this, though. We've been talking about this for years. For 10 years now, we've been talking about how we can modulate um, cytokine activity by using Wobenzyme. And at the same time, it, it can help with uh, all those other things we talk about with, you know, weight and um, controls normal um, cell division and et cetera. It's an amazing um, thing there. I've done a lot of research on it. If you haven't read the, my compiled books, on, send me an email. We'll get you a copy of that. Um, 
of interest when I um, went back then and reviewed Adrenamend. Now I need to update my Adrenamend uh, page because some of this research is like brand new because now everyone's all interested in the thymus gland all of a sudden. And we're realizing that those six herbs in Adrenamend actually increase the weight of the thymus and prevent atrophy and, and increase thymus activity. Basically, they maintain uh, immune, um, they make immune competence. The thymus remain, remains competent when you're taking this. So now I gotta make a bigger chart for doing a man and add one more system so that chart's gonna get bigger next time you see it. So keep that in mind, we're always learning new stuff. Now thymus is no longer a lump of fat, it's an active tissue. So what about this whole thing about the adrenal gland and stress, okay? Um, where did that one come from? Okay, that's, uh, all right. Um, <laughs> okay, remember the adrenal glands is one the first line for maintaining homeostasis, the balance of all the different systems. Okay, um, if you don't have homeostasis, you have allostasis. The adrenal gland has two components, the adrenal cortex, which makes the steroid hormones such as cortisol, DHEA, and progesterone, as we know. And men, all of us have progesterone. Women, 60% of your progesterone comes from those little glands there. If you're not in homeostasis, similar state, you're in allostasis. You're in a different state. You're allostatic. You're miserable. That's allostasis, okay? This is not new news. In 1950, as you've seen in my previous lectures, Hans Salier discussed this. In an article he had published in the British Medical Journal, which he called Stress, and the general adaptation syndrome, if you look real close, he did a lot more than talk about adrenal glands. Yes, he talked about the adrenal uh, cortex and the adrenal medulla, but he also talked about uh, renal tissue, blood vessels, uh, cellular health, on and on many tissues. And as we've talked about in the adrenal webinar, here's all the different adaptation systems that he mentions in that article. Sound familiar? These are all the systems that adrenal memory is designed to repair, okay? Now he called this the general adaptation syndrome. Okay, now we're, we're calling the adrenal fatigue now. It's like we it's like we took some white out and we wired out everything from here down and everything from here up. We're only focusing on these two, but it's much more than adrenal fatigue. And if you go even further, you know, everyone knows the Hans Sayer wrote a book called The Stress of Life, a nice little paperback, you know, nice easy read, fun, has you know, but if you look at his textbook, which is huge, weighs about five pounds, I have a copy of it right here. Here you go. Listen to this. That was his textbook, okay? The textbook of endocrinology, 1949, he talks about every system in the body is affected by stress. This chart lists all these systems, and on the same page and, and the text all around it, he goes on and on and on. So every system is affected by stress. So this general adaptation syndrome, Selye got it back in 1950s, but it never caught on. Instead, now we're starting to talk about adrenal fatigue as if it's a new discovery. And I kept asking myself, why didn't we get it? Why didn't we understand general adaptation syndrome? Well, it's because in his textbook, he abbreviated it. He kept calling it GAS, GAS, GAS. And this is the problem here is that this is why Hansen's discovery of the general adaptation syndrome never became well known because the first time he tried to explain to someone and said, you have gas. Uh, it was not met very well, okay? People didn't understand it, they were insulted, and um, so we had to wait 50 years till the year 2000 and come up with a pseudo synonym called adrenal fatigue, but we're actually talking about the general adaptation syndrome. And here's the systems that we're talking about. Again, in review, homeostasis regulatory systems. The adrenal is the primary, you have the um, cortical um, steroid hormones on one side, so it's course on DHA, the other side is the um, medulla hormones, epinorepinephrine, and then all the other systems down there. There's actually more systems than that. And we're gonna, um, as I just mentioned, we're seeing more, more hormones are being discovered as we speak, and we're gonna expand that as time goes on, but that's already a lot of gas to put up with right now, so we'll focus on that. So our goal is to modulate all the system stress response here, you know, is to adjust or regulate to keep in the proper proportion of each of these systems here. So how do you do that with adrenal health? My way, my first approach to adrenal health is get them on Adrenamend. In fact, Adrenamend is becoming one of the first lines for many of my patients because they have multiple systems. They come inside and they say, I have andropause and adrenal fatigue and I'm tired and this and that. And you know, my circadian rhythm's off. I say, well, let's get you on Adrenamend first and then you know, give it time. Then we can add tests again and again later. But get on endocrine complete and Adrenamend in the morning and you're gonna see the job done. If they have inflammation of any kind, 
And I know the cytokines attacking the entire endocrine system. I put them on Wobenzyme as well. Wobenz, uh, inflammation, systemic inflammation is ubiquitous. We're all struggling with it. And it's very um, important that we address that. And of course, I use the foundation probiotics and fish oils. And then I may start to say, what are the formulations do you need? You have primary adrenal fatigue. Maybe I need to give you some estrogen as well if you have a lot of vasomotor symptoms as a woman. Or if you have problems with thyroid function, I may mix it. But adrenal health, here's my first course of action. Add this is inflammation, then add the secondary formulations as you see clinically, all right? Now remember, a lot of times hormone levels are going to come back, quote, within normal. Okay, but being 20% inside normal range and being miserable is not normal. It's not just the levels of the hormones, it's the listing of the hormones. What about the pancreas? How are we going to deal with um, pancreatic dysfunction here? Uh, well, I think we moved a slide. I think, I think we missed something here. Okay. Well, the thing that's, uh, there's a slide missing, I think. Let me double check. Yeah. Okay. How to deal with this is if you look at, um, yeah, here it is. I apologize. It's right here. Okay. Okay, when you're looking at pancreatic function and glucose health, how I'm working with that at this point in time is I'm using the adrenal memory with the endocrine complete because all the systems are involved in dysglycemia, as I mentioned. Adrenal is involved, thyroid, gonadal, um, the glucose insulin system is all supported by adrenal gland. I really like berberine, and so I, I use the uh, berberine balance as well um, to help with the um, uh, glucose insulin system and to help with beta cell function. I like the uh, ingredient side glucobium quite well. So those are things I may use uh, as an aggressive approach to let's get this under control here. And of course, um, if they have an uh, antibody or inflammation, I use the Wobenzyme and of course the foundations. One thing to keep in mind is, you know, since glucose dysfunction is a problem with every hormone disorder, when you study the detailed information on all the formulations that we've created for you here, Every one of the hormone-specific formulations has components in it that help with glycemic control, okay? Like especially, like, look at test sequence for women that are at the top of the list, okay? Dysglycemia is, is paramount a problem in that population because of the high androgens. So many of the herbs inside you, you could actually look at that and go, wow, is this a blood sugar formula or an anti-androgen formula? Well, it's both. It's primarily to control androgens, but I chose herbs that also have just help with the dysglycemia, et cetera. So you'll see that each of these formulations supports the glycemic in some way, but you, the, the biggest gun should be the formulations here with the berberine and glucobrium. So glucose management can be well, and as I said, there's new research coming out even now as we speak. There's been new discoveries that are still being debated in the literature. I think we're going to have some real answers by the end of this year as to what's actually going on. Um, and we're actually saying, as I mentioned, uh, developing antibodies because of the dysglycemia uh, and other tissue being affected. The female gon uh, gonadal tissue, of course, makes estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. What is a healthy level for hormones? Remember, 60% of the follicular phase progesterone comes from the adrenal gland. I look at the follicular phase as the physiological baseline, okay? That's where the woman's hormone levels are when she's not ovulating, when she does not have a corpus luteum, you know, to, to get, let, get ready for pregnancy, okay? Looking at corpus luteal levels for progesterone are way too high to walk around every day of her life. Same with estradiol, the levels are higher, the testosterone levels are higher. So when I look at a lab test and people go, what should I aim for? I don't want to go, I went to a mainstream laboratory, got a blood test because my insurance company pays for it, and my estradiol level, it's this level, but they say that a postmenopause patient, this low level is, quote, normal. Well, it's normal if you take a bunch of, you know, that population. Remember, lab results are based upon a population they grab. But if you look at optimal levels, I say, well, what, do, what is a normal physiological baseline? I look at the physiological follicular levels of estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone, and that's what I say would be an ideal range for a woman to look at. And a, a number of clinicians I, I, I work with and I listen to them talking, they're saying the same thing. We're not trying to have luteal levels, you know, like you're trying to get pregnant, or ovatory levels, you know. What's another name for luteal levels of, um, for luteal phase? Premenstrual, okay? The luteal level hormones are premenstrual hormones. We don't want those levels, okay? We want follicular levels, all right? Um, going back to when we talk about the aging process, this book came out. Uh, it started in the 90s. It was, it was published in the year 2000. Bottom line is, you know, in 93, when I ordered testosterone levels for women at saliva tests, no one would give me that. Everyone says, why are you measuring testosterone in women? So I had to 
by male saliva tests, and then the lab finally hired me, and then they were the first ones to do saliva testing in women, and then of course within two months, every sli everyone's doing saliva testing of testosterone in women. But again, you could not order saliva testosterone in women in the early 90s, um, so we got to change that. There's actually 12 major types of menopause, actually archetypes, based upon hormone patterns. This is pretty obvious uh, if you look at it, and what you do is you look at um, what, what's high, low, and normal, and how to intervene and treat that. That's, that's, um, if you haven't read the book, you should go back, because some of the stuff that we're talking about now was actually first put inside there, such as the um, different menopause types, the PD ratio, the um, talk about estriol and some of those things that we're now starting to come to grips with. Um, it was pretty, a lot of things were redefined back then. So and menopause support has all these and or types of the equation if you want to look at it. Depending upon what menopause type a person has, she could use um, estrogen and or progesterone and or some type of androgen assistance. Either she needs her testosterone to be supported or she needs to be controlled. Okay, then the same token, I look at the foundation, enzymes, um, uh, systemic enzyme support if she has inflammation, and I may look at thyroid, adrenal, or um, other things as well. If I suspect a woman um, has an androgen excess disorder type of uh, PMS or androgen excess type of menopause, I'll always start on testiquench first to control the androgen excess before I start on adrenamen. So if I have a PCOS patient or a you know, menopause type um, 3, 6, 9, or 12 walk through my door and they have androgen excess and they have, quote, adrenal fatigue, I'll get them on test to quench first to control the androgen fire and they'll put them on adrenomen because adrenomen has herbs that, you know, support the adrenal gland which makes androgen, so we need to control that first. So that's one caveat. And remember, estrogen does not create estradiol and estrogen, you know, does not have, you know, proliferative herbs inside of it. So estrogen and ester quench can be used together because then we're not trying to raise estrogens, we're trying to get them to, we're trying to control the symptoms of estrogen deficiency. So there's some of the caveats on that and of course you'll see all the detail in the extensive webinar we gave in the past on that. Just as there's four types of, um, 12 types of menopause, many types of PMS, I didn't come up with this, this was came, came up with years ago um, by Abraham, Abraham um, and some other different authors talked about different variants of PMS, they can have either low progesterone, low androgens, low estrogens, or excessive androgens, could be both adrenal and gonadal origin. These people present with electrolyte aldosterone problems like water and salt retention, and that's because testosterone raised aldosterone. So PMS type H, which was called hyperhidrosis, you know, if you look at it, these are basically the symptoms of um, androgen excess. So of course you know how to treat those now, looking at the specific, hormone specific formulations. In men, all we really want is testosterone. We really don't want to make in a lot of estradiol. We have some estradiol. We need some of it. It's, 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 it's actually required during our reproductive years for um, uh, spermatogenesis and, and um, motility. But as we get eight, older, that's the last community, more estrogen. So when you look at the andropause, you use the test again and or ester quench to get that TD ratio back in order. The foundations uh, control inflammation. And many of the antipods patients come to me with like this global fatigue um, th disorder going on, multiple system fatigue, and of course we, I use adrenaline for that, and um, uh, thiamine if that picture presents itself as well. And we can't talk about men's health without talking about the prostate as well. Testiquench for men and estrequench. You know what's interesting? It was actually a um, an NIH website, um, the one on you know the um, kidney health subdivision of the NIH, uh, 15 years ago, they were talking about how estrogen is involved in prostate dysplasia, <laughs> okay? So, I mean, if it's been on an NIH website for over a decade and a half, you know, we need to recognize that part of prostate health is to calm down the estrogen. So, part of my intervention is I always use testiquench and uh, Wobenzyme as well as estrequench. All those three are important. I really like the DIM Enhance because that's one of the best formulations I've seen to really help chew up and get rid of estrogen that's already there. I like the fact that they put inside all the other cofactors like uh, cocoon and the green tea and the wasabi, etc. It works much better than dim alone. And of course, pectisol helps with um, cell migration, etc. And then of course, the other nutritional foundation things we can use as well. Some of those same concepts you can look at in breast tissue health. 
where there's a woman complaining with you of nostalgia and you know fibrocystic, et cetera, or other more severe um, breast disorders, um, ester quench actually uh, has herbs that have been documented to have aromatase inhibition properties. But more important than that, we have our own endogenous aromatase inhibition system built inside of us. And if you read the studies, I talk about that. What we're doing is we're supporting your body's own innate, your own endogenous ability to control how much estrogen you have. And then, of course, use DIM Enhance as well, um, the foundations, and if you want to be more um, supportive, getting rid of the estrogen, you know, calcium deglucurate is a great add-on, inspect the salt. So you customize the formula, you personalize it depending upon the patient's need, how fast and how much what they want to do. Okay, so all these formulations, they, 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 they can work together, they cross back and forth, but there's a few variations. First of all, you know, you don't see a line going from test to gain to test to quench, okay? Of any of them. So test to gain is not really needed in people who may require either test to quench for women or test to quench for men. You don't really see that going on here as well, okay? Now, if you have a woman that looks like she may need test to quench for women because she has high androgens, you know, she's complaining she has a piece of picture and she has, oh, I have breast pain, I think I need, you know, it's too much estrogen, double check because androgens can also cause nostalgia in women, okay? So some of these women that you're going, wow, she looks like she has high androgens, but she has breast tenderness. Maybe I'll give her estrogen quench. Double check because sometimes they have like barely any estrogen and it's the androgens that's causing this. So do that before we decide to throw estrogen quench on top of um, um, test quench for women. That's one of the caveats there. Again, uh, this is a review of all the different webinars I've done in the past, but mostly get the point across that the aging theories are not linear, they're more like a cluster. And you can probably, you're probably sitting there thinking right now, I left out three or four different things, and you're right. Every time I turn around, there's another factor that's involved in the aging process. But I think the key is looking at the cluster analysis and how they all work together. And as we move forward toward that and we get out of our, oh, I'm for telomeres, I'm for this, I'm for that, and we recognize that they're all involved, we're going to see our cells progress at a much faster rate. One of the most important things I find is to, is to always look at the, pa the whole need of the patient. It's important that the foundation is right there where it belongs. The foundation at the bottom with the vitamins and minerals, those things you start up with and work your way up. Work through the other um, needs that the body has based upon the patient's individual needs and we're going to be able to make a big difference in the um, healthy aging and active lifestyle. And uh, here's my contact um, information. Thank you for staying a few minutes over. And I'll let Christy take this now. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. That was a wealth of information. We really appreciate your time and all the knowledge that you shared. I do want to encourage our listeners to visit douglaslabs.com. You can download a copy of the Hormone-Specific Formulations Guide. It is a great product guide that will help you to decipher which products to choose as well as some of the clinical protocols that Dr. Collins referred to today will be found in the Hormone Health section on the Douglas Lab website. And then furthermore, you can review a recording of this webinar starting tomorrow.